Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I'm excited to tell you about my new book, Girl Boss. Girl Boss. Welcome to the Girl Boss community. You can go into engineering, you can go into science. Success isn't just up and to the right. What is it about me that made you think I want to be relatable? Where girls come just to be girls and feel good about that. Girl power. Gaslight, gatekeep, girl boss. The girl boss, otherwise known as the boss babe, has become a term that has seemingly spiraled out of control. You can find the term girl boss plastered all over billboards, magazines, and t-shirts. The term girl boss is proudly used by CEOs and MLM reps alike. But what does it mean? In this video, we're diving into the rise and fall of the girl boss and how it may have influenced pop culture in a pretty negative way. But first, before we get into that, if you like this type of content, don't forget to subscribe and give this video a thumbs up and let's get into it. The term girl boss was first brought into the public eye in 2014. The term was used in popular books written by women CEOs, like hashtag girl boss by Sophia Amoruso, founder of Nasty Gal, and Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg, COO of Facebook. Sheryl Sandberg argued in her book Lean In that more women gaining power in the workplace and becoming executives would help create more equality. And thus, the girl boss was born. After the success of Hashtag Girl Boss, Amoruso went on to launch a girl boss media company with networking conferences, branded merchandise, and a Netflix series. Jeez, that's a lot of stuff going on. I wonder what happened to her original company, Nasty Gal. Oh. 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 The problem is women executives can be just as exploitative as male executives. Surprise, surprise, equality. We all aren't that different after all. We all are equally terrible. And the reality is girl boss is just hustle culture repackaged and resold to women. Hustle culture is yet another primarily millennial toxic ideology that if you relentlessly work or grind and also relentlessly post on social media about your hashtag hustle, hashtag grind, that you are indeed the superior millennial. I personally think there's many flavors of hustle culture from my favorite and that which I have the most most experience with, there's the startup hustle culture that features eccentric startup founders bragging about how much they work and encouraging their employees to work 12 plus hours a day. If you go into any WeWork, you'll see plenty of hustle culture memorabilia. There's also the frat bro or stock bro hustle culture that emphasizes obtaining material goods is a little too inspired by Wolf of Wall Street and random rise and grind Instagram accounts. And from personal experience, I've found most of these dudes post about hustling more than they actually hustle. In fact, I don't think they've had to actually hustle a day in their life, but maybe that's just me. Then there's the girl boss culture, which is like any other capitalist girl thing, all about materialism, surrounding yourself with books and podcasts, and buying from girl boss companies, and monetarily supporting all girl boss things. But more on that later. Much of the narrative surrounding girl boss is to work hard and hustle and make something of yourself and build a career, be the girl boss do the work. But we've also seen over time examples of girl boss being used in a very toxic way, like within MLMs who use the term to justify reps pouring thousands and thousands into products and not making much of a profit. Yeah, you may be losing money, but you're a girl boss, right? You're making something of yourself. You're building a company. You're building something of value here. Be a girl boss. Empower yourself. The whole term girl boss is basically telling women that your value is based off of how successful of a career you can have. Be a girl boss, don't just be a girl. 
also the original girl boss narrative that was created. This idea that if more women were in power, there would be more equality, which would lead to workers being treated better and more workers being treated with more equality. That whole narrative turned out to not be true at all. Because believe it or not, Surprisingly, women are people, and just like anyone who is a human being, women can be influenced by power, by greed, and other privileges and incentives of being in power and wanting to hold on to that power, which can lead anyone down a path of being exploitative. <laughs> So let's talk about the many influential women who have collectively made up the concept of girl boss. First on the list, Sofia Amoruso. Amoruso founded Nasty Gal, a women's fashion retailer that went on to be named one of the fastest growing companies by Inc. Magazine in 2012. Sofia, in just a few years, you created Nasty Gal, and it's something of a phenomenon. I mean, you guys have got 128 million in revenue this year, more or less, and a hugely profitable company. How did this all start? So I started an eBay store in late 2006. So you started this company? Started Nasty Gals and eBay yeah. store 10 years ago. 10 years ago? 10 in November, it's been 10. That's incredible growth in 10 years. It's a lot, but like, yeah. you know, you start when you're 22, you can only hope you grow a whole lot between right. 22 and 32, jeez. When I started, Nasty gal. I was 22 years old. I started an eBay store. I didn't have an education. I didn't have alumni of any kind. I had no idea I was even starting a business. And then I wound up with the title of CEO and it exploded. In 2016, Sophia was named one of the richest self-made women in the world by Forbes. Sophia published a book titled Hashtag Girl Boss, which really coined the phrase girl boss. And the book was so successful that Netflix ended up adapting the book into a series, which was canceled after one season. Critics saying it was a call to millennial narcissists. But the rise and success of Sophia Amoruso did not last very long. On January 12th of 2015, Amoruso stepped down as CEO of Nasty Gal due to leadership problems, and in November of 2016, the company filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy, with Amoruso resigning as executive chairwoman. By early 2016, Sophia earned a spot as one of Forbes' richest self-made women. Then just a few months later, her company collapsed after one too many mistakes. The reason for the bankruptcy is seemingly leadership changes, a toxic work culture, and poor communication. Much of Amoroso's fortune left along with the bankruptcy of Nasty Gal. In December of 2017, Amoruso went on to found Girlboss Media, a company aimed at creating hashtag Girlboss content, videos, and podcasts. Sophia also created Girlboss Rallies, which were weekend-long instructional events for young entrepreneurs that ranged from $500 to $1,400. Girlboss started with the book five years ago. Girlboss today is creating a platform for women to do just that, where even if they're not entrepreneurs, they're entrepreneurial and they can mm. share not just what they do, but who they are in a world where we're not LinkedIn Monday through Friday and Instagram Saturday and Sunday. We're so much more than right, that. Right, exactly. Then in October of 2020, Emma Russo also stepped down once again as CEO, this time from Girlboss Media Company, citing the pandemic and declining revenue as the reason she stepped away. The many failures of Emma Russo proves A, maybe Sophia wasn't the best CEO, even though she coined the term Girlboss she may have not been the best boss. But the many failures of Sophia Amoruso also makes me sad because I was rooting for you. We were all rooting for you. Another prominent girl boss figure is Sheryl Sandberg, the COO of Facebook. She joined Facebook at a time that Facebook was trying to become profitable, and she was largely successful at her job and became well-known and respected for her accomplishments at Facebook. This led to the release of her first book, Lean In, Women Work and the Will to Lead, published on March 11th of 2013. The book concerns business leadership and development, issues with the lack of women in government and business leadership positions, and feminism. Women are not making it to the top of any profession anywhere in the world. The numbers tell the story quite clearly. 190 heads of state, nine are women. Of all the people in parliament in the world, 13% are women. 
In the corporate sector, women at the top, C-level jobs, board seats, tops out at 15, 16 percent. The numbers have not moved since 2002 and are going in the wrong direction. I came out of college over 20 years ago, and I thought that, you know, look, all of my peers were men and women, all the people above me were all men, but that would change because your generation had done such an amazing job fighting for equality, equality was now ours for the taking. And it wasn't, because year after year, I was one of fewer and fewer, and now often the only woman in a room. Lean In is intended for professional women to help them achieve their career goals and for men who want to contribute to a more equitable society. The ultimate goal is to encourage women to lean into positions of leadership because she believes that by having more female voices in positions of power, there will be more equitable opportunities created for everyone. How do we change these numbers at the top? How do we make this different? I want to start out by saying I talk about this, about keeping women in the workforce, because I really think that's the answer. In the high-income part of our workforce, in the people who end up at the top Fortune 500 CEO jobs or the equivalent in other industries, the problem I am convinced is that women are dropping out. Criticisms of the book include claims that Sandberg is too elitist and another that she is tone deaf to the struggles faced by the average woman in the workplace. For example, the book has been criticized for overlooking the struggles of mothers who may not be able to lean in. Sandberg was also largely behind the movement to ban the word bossy. In March of 2014, Sandberg and Lean In sponsored the Ban Bossy campaign, a television and social media campaign designed to discourage the word bossy from general use due to its perceived harmful effect on young girls. There was also a website providing school training material, leadership tips, and an online pledge form to which visitors can promise not to use the word. But Sandberg did get some criticism. The New York Times published a report in 2018 detailing Sandberg's role in handling Facebook's public relations after revelations of Russian interference. There are implications that Facebook operated almost like a mob. Um, one of the lawsuits says that Mark Zuckerberg had the philosophy of it is better to buy than compete. Facebook got WhatsApp and Instagram and the power grab. Is that the philosophy there? Did he say it? It's better to buy than compete. Well, let me start just quickly by saying thank you, Tamron, for having me on the show. We have talked about this for a long time, and I've been a fan for a long time. I've loved the success of your show, and I love that you have a female team behind you, not just you. Thank you. But your executive producer. It really thank matters you. to me. Um, so these are serious lawsuits, and I understand that there is real concern about the size and the power of the tech companies. But I think it's really hard to make the argument that we don't compete and compete hard for your time and attention. According to the Wall Street Journal, during a meeting, Mark Zuckerberg blamed Sandberg personally for the outcome of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. And the way that Sheryl Sandberg handled the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal was kind of shying away, not leaning in, or being upfront and forthcoming about what was going on. Next on the girl boss list is Elizabeth Holmes. Elizabeth Holmes was the founder and CEO of Theranos, a now defunct health technology company. Elizabeth and the company claimed to have revolutionized blood testing technology by developing testing methods that could use surprisingly small volumes of blood, like a finger prick. This CEO is out for blood. The company is valued at over $9 billion. You've got over 500 employees, I think. Um, 700. 700 now, okay. Can you tell us who you are and what you do, what your company does? Sure. Yeah, I'm over the last 11 years, we've reinvented the traditional laboratory infrastructure. By 2015, Forbes had named Holmes as the youngest and wealthiest self-made female billionaire in America on the basis of a $9 billion valuation of her company. But soon after, the company was exposed for being a total fraud and lying about the technology they claimed to have, defrauding people and putting people in extreme danger by claiming to have accurate blood testing results when their technology was not accurate. Holmes has been arrested and charged with massive fraud. Lately, one of the most exciting privately held companies in Silicon Valley has come under fire. I'm talking about Theranos. Just this morning, the Wall Street Journal ran a pretty scathing article about the company, alleging that the company's proprietary testing devices may be inaccurate and basically accusing Theranos of deceptive practices. Thank you, Elizabeth. I have to tell you, in all my years, I can't recall a private company that I have to candidly many have never heard of getting this kind of attention and scrutiny. What do you think is going on here? This is what happens when you work to change things. And first they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. Elizabeth Holmes, once Silicon Valley's fastest rising star, is now under the harsh glare of a very different kind of spotlight. Ms. Holmes, please raise your right hand. She's finally forced to answer to the Securities and Exchange Commission as she's investigated for an alleged elaborate years-long fraud. 
Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Elizabeth Holmes was lifted up by so many influential people as a woman to be admired in the tech industry. I believe people want to stand on their own two feet. I think they want to be empowered. And, um, and that's one of the reasons I've been so impressed by your dogged determination, not only to cut the cost and increase the quality of lab tests, but to give people who give the blood the results of their test. Yeah. Absolutely. You can go into engineering, you can go into science, and you can be successful, and you can build a family, and we should be doing this. Um, so having women involved with this company and building this company and leading this company because of who they are, especially in the engineering and science space. I mean, I was the only woman uh -huh. in chemical engineering at Stanford and in the electrical engineering program that I was at at Stanford and that must change. But her entire career was founded on a complete lie. Elizabeth Holmes might be facing up to 20 years in prison, but she sure looks happy prancing around San Francisco. Hi, Elizabeth. I'm Lisa Guerrero with Inside Edition. We'd like to know if you had an opportunity to watch the documentary about you. Elizabeth, a lot of young women looked up to you, especially in tech. What would you have to say to those young women? Next girl boss, Leandra Medine. I knew that I wanted to build a brand that would both outlive me and carry a title that allowed people to feel like they were members of this like sort of indie sisterhood. Leandra Medine Cohen is an American author, blogger, and humor writer best known for Man Repeller, an independent fashion and lifestyle website. So I launched Man Repeller in 2011 when I was a junior in college. And it started as a site about trends that women love and men hate. It was supposed to be a call to action for us as women to celebrate what we want to wear. The blog Man Repeller became widely successful, and Leandra was lifted up as a girl boss of sorts and a voice for the millennial girl boss. As I've continued working on the site, the sort of ideology has become very fine-tuned and finessed. And I've been saying that it's a humorous website about serious fashion, a site about trends that women love and men hate. But I also very much want it to be this sort of discussion board or community where girls come just to be girls and feel good about that. And that's it. That's valuable. Cue claps. <laughs> I'm, just I'm just kidding. Girl power. Medine even launched MR by Man Repeller, a line of loafers, flats, metallic booties, and heels. And it seemed that Man Repeller really became an overall brand. That is, until Medine announced in June of 2020 that she would step back her involvement in Man Repeller after allegations emerged that she had failed former staffers of color. In September 2020, the site was rebranded to Repeller, and Medine is still listed as the founder on the contributor page. But on October 22nd, Cohen confirmed that Repeller would be shutting down due to financial constraints. And last girl boss that I'll talk about today is Danielle Bernstein. Danielle Bernstein is an American fashion designer and the founder of the fashion blog and brand We Wear What. My name is Danielle Bernstein and I'm the founder of We Wear What. Blogging as a whole has completely disrupted traditional media and advertising in itself. We have given brands a completely new outlet to reach a very specific audience that they maybe wouldn't have reached otherwise. Sitting front row in New York Fashion Week is in itself disruptive. She has collaborated with numerous fashion brands and has launched her own fashion lines. At the age of 24, Danielle was placed on the Forbes 30 under 30 list. Danielle Bernstein has nearly 1.8 million Instagram followers. At 25 years old, she's already made Forbes' 30 under 30 list. Her brand, We Wore What, includes a blog, a podcast, a YouTube YouTube channel, brand collaborations, and her own clothing line, earning her upward of seven figures a year. In March of 2020, Bernstein also launched a namesake brand exclusively at Macy's called Danielle Bernstein. In May of 2020, Bernstein published an autobiography called This Is Not a Fashion Story, Taking Chances, Breaking Rules, and Being a Boss in the Big City. Very gaslight gatekeep girl boss. The book appeared on the New York Times bestsellers list and was featured on the business list. However, the New York Times has since placed a dagger symbol alongside the book, indicating its listing includes suspicious bulk purchases. But then Danielle Bernstein was exposed for copying other designers' designs. In 2018, Bernstein received attention for copying the designs of various jewelry brands when she launched a series of products with Nordstrom. Bernstein subsequently apologized in a tear-filled Instagram post and withdrew the copied pieces from the collection. Hi guys. I hope you read my last slide. Everything I said in it was sincere and real and everything I do is with my followers best interest in mind and that won't change. Happy Sunday. I just want to let everyone know and remind you guys of the inspiration behind this entire collection is this. My grandfather was Poppy Lockett and passed away a year ago 
and that I created this so that you guys could hold your loved ones close to your heart. And, and I hope you guys will still support this collaboration. In 2020, Bernstein announced a design for a cloth face mask with a chain. Fashion watchdog group Diet Prada, an Instagram account dedicated to highlighting instances of design copying, observed the mask was nearly identical to a patent-pending model created by a Latino brand called Second Wing. Bernstein had earlier requested free samples from the company. Bernstein denied that she had copied the design from Second Wind. Days later, Bernstein posted an Instagram photo of herself wearing what she claimed were a vintage pair of gym shorts right writing the caption that she would be remaking the shorts to sell. The shorts were actually from an Etsy shop run by an Australian brand, Art Garments. After the Etsy seller published a receipt showing Bernstein had purchased the shorts from their store, Bernstein edited the caption to read, Correction, these are from Etsy and I totally thought they were vintage, but they are made to order. Someone on my team ordered them for me a while back and I will not be making them. So, blaming the team. In August of 2020, a Brooklyn lingerie store alleged that Bernstein had copied their signature design, which they used on tissue packaging and used it on swimwear as print wallpaper. Bernstein has also been known to supposedly bully a Poshmark seller who was selling swimwear that ended up being an unpublished collection from Bernstein's collaboration with Onia. And overall, she's kind of been exposed as a shady person in the fashion industry who paraded and uplifted herself as a girl boss when in reality, she was copying so many other people and their designs and basically putting smaller companies down and smaller sellers and businesses. The blaming the team part of Danielle Bernstein also reminds me a lot of Rachel Hollis, another supposed girl boss and motivational speaker that I did a whole dedicated video on. So I won't go too much into her career, but lately she's received a lot of flack for basically being like, I'm a girl boss who's unrelatable and I want to be privileged and unrelatable. And I mentioned that there's a sweet woman who comes to my house twice a week and cleans. She's my my house cleaner she cleans the toilets someone commented and said you are privileged af and i was like you're right i'm super freaking privileged but also i work my ass off to have the money to have someone come twice a week and clean my toilets and i told her that and then she said well you're unrelatable <gasps> what is it about me that made you think I want to be relatable. So, so many of these prominent women who had branded themselves as girl bosses, making major changes in major industries, ended up falling right into the status quo, exploiting people, not creating safe and equal workplaces, and even going to the point of lying, stealing, and ripping people off. But alas, the term girl boss picked up traction initially for this revolutionary idea that more women should be in power or hold executive positions in the workplace. Because, you know, men in the workplace are always referred to as boy bosses, so it just makes sense. But very soon after this phrase began to gain traction, using the term girl boss became a strategic way to promote your business. Buy from my company because I'm a cool millennial and chic girl boss. Support a girl boss company because a girl boss company will probably treat workers better. Girl boss branding all of a sudden became synonymous with a more ethical company or a more empowered company, which is just interesting in itself. And a lot of companies strategically branded themselves as the girl boss clothing company, the girl boss media company, to tap into the millennial women niche and grow their business off of that demographic. Not only were you empowering girl bosses through buying from their company, but you felt more empowered as a customer too, because if they could do it, why couldn't you? And it was that inspirational message that so many women resonated with and why so many people chose to buy from a girl boss company. Statistics show that millennials are far more interested in ethical businesses and buying ethically than their predecessors. We've seen companies rise up that are way more focused on ethics or that are focused on supporting small businesses like Etsy rise to the forefront with the millennial purchase. Millennials care much more than other generations about their dollar counting towards something meaningful that could possibly help society. But 
Unfortunately, that has been exploited. That entire value has been exploited by companies who parade themselves as being ethical, who practice greenwashing, or even practice pseudoscience in pretending to be the more natural, healthier options in order to get the millennial dollar. The girl boss rhetoric was used in a similar way to get purchasing power from millennials by convincing millennials that this girl boss company would somehow be a more ethical company. And, um, yeah, that worked out. The more you look into the girl boss phrase and who has historically used the term girl boss, it becomes glaringly obvious that girl boss was never a very inclusive phrase and seemed to be reserved solely for cis white women. All of the girl bosses are white women marketing the girl boss concept to more white women. For example, two former employees of Refinery29 told CNN Business's Carrie Flynn that girl boss Barbrich of Refinery29 would reject photos of black or plus sized models, deeming them off brand. And this is something Barbridge basically admitted to CNN, telling CNN that the brand's shortcomings came at the detriment of black women and women of color in particular. Okay, then fix it. Maybe if you're already aware of this shortcoming. Another girl boss founder of the company Man Repeller issued an Instagram apology on the lack of diversity in her company. So this whole inclusion girl boss empowerment thing. How's that working out? Another girl boss CEO of Band.do was investigated by BuzzFeed to foster a racist mean girls environment in the company. So wow, surprise, surprise. The inclusion of one woman at the top of a company does not mean the inclusion for all. The Wing, you guessed it, another girl boss company, was exposed by the New York Times for their low pay, poor treatment, and racism at the company. The Wing is part co-working, uh, part social club, part community space, um, exclusively designed for women. This is The Wing. Part pseudo-sorority, part co-working space, part Instagram fever dream. Articles recounting stories of racism, low wages, and the failed promise of a feminist workplace began popping up left and right at the start of this year. One particular Instagram account, at Flew the Coop, is gathering stories of former space staff who were mistreated and underpaid during their employment at the wing. With a non-disclosure agreement in place, this account gives former employees a platform to speak about their experiences with anonymity. These employees were sold on the same feminist utopia as the one you saw me enjoying earlier but instead of the opportunities they were promised, they were just taken advantage of. Even Reformation, a brand I used to love but could never afford, basically the cool girl clothing brand, was exposed by former employees for a racist culture that pushed out black employees. What? The heck. It blows my mind that these CEOs who are basically like, we're girl bosses, we're helping to get more women in power, can basically push aside everyone else who doesn't fit their very specific mold of what a girl boss is and be like, we're gonna empower you guys, but not you though, not you. And it just goes to show that this entire concept of the girl boss is a fake facade meant for people to parade around and hashtag in a performative way, but not for any real systemic change to be made besides a few women CEOs. These company practices got so bad that by mid 2020, eight female founders had to step down from companies they were leading because of these issues. Literally, what the fuck? But as this corporate girl boss facade was beginning to show cracks, the phrase was simultaneously taking off. And soon after, more and more brands got a hold of it and realized the potential it yields. And the term girl boss was even further commodified by influencers and Instagram brands that all wanted to sell you the idea of women empowerment. Not the real thing, 
just the idea of it. It was like this trickle down effect, like a pyramid of sorts, where at the top you had women CEOs who kind of coined the phrase girl boss and used it to sell books and build media companies. Then you had companies built by women parading the term girl boss as a way to brand themselves. Then after that, you had influencers using the term girl boss and Instagram brands. And then at the very bottom, bottom of this pyramid, you had pyramid schemes using the term girl boss. And that's when things really hit rock bottom, if you will. MLMs and MLM reps have notoriously adopted the term hashtag girl boss as a way to brand their MLM companies as for women because women are targeted by a lot of MLM companies for recruitment. Even though we know most people in MLMs lose money by adopting the hashtag girl boss or hashtag boss babe, these companies could could basically convince MLM reps, you are indeed a boss babe. You are indeed empowering yourself through purchasing our starter kit and cold messaging people on social media. I personally feel like the girl boss rhetoric has helped the MLM industry exponentially because it has basically allowed MLMs to convince their reps that they are empowering themselves through involving themselves in a network marketing company. Their whole team or upline or downline is filled with mostly women. So we're all a girl team. We're all boss babes empowering one another. They're told to target and recruit more women depending on what MLM it is. But a lot of MLM companies like Unique, doTERRA, Monet, all target majority women. So by using the term boss babe, you feel like you're empowering other women too through recruiting them. At this point, boss babe was not only commodified, but turned into an exploitative phrase as a way to exploit women's desires to feel empowered and successful for the benefit of the companies that they're buying into. But additionally, this rock bottom began a new wave of what I would probably call girl boss cringe, which even the phrase cringe itself, I feel like is silly to use because who am I to say what's cringy and what's not cringy? If you're doing something in your life that's making you happy, go for it, post about it, all that. But why I would call this era of girl boss, the MLM rep era of girl boss, girl boss cringe, is because so many MLM reps began posting on social media using the hashtag girl boss or boss babe, basically taking the phrase and not actually attributing any further or deeper meaning to it besides look at this flashy life that I'm living, look at this girl boss life, look at my girl boss team, look at my girl boss trips, look at my girl boss car, and all of a sudden, girl boss became completely intertwined with materialism. So here are some posts of what I would personally call girl boss cringe. Better together. What do flight attendants, chiropractors, financial analysts, bloggers, career women, influencers, virtual assistants, stay-at-home moms, and hairstylists have in common? They're all working this business with me. This community is unreal with its support and encouragement. If you're thinking your current friends are talking about you as soon as you leave the table, well then, girlfriend, it's time for a new table, and you can sit with us. Today's forecast, 100% chance of winning. As I close out my sixth month in this business, I've looked back at where I started and I'm amazed at what this business has given me in such a short time. I've gained more confidence in myself. I'm better at time management and prioritizing than I've ever been. I've built so many new relationships and found the most supportive and inspiring group of women. Yes, we sell shampoo, but we also help people regain confidence in themselves and impact people's lives. I know it's hard to understand or believe in something you've never tried, so you just have to trust me. We are in the business of gratitude and I'm filled with that every day because of this opportunity. Hi, beautiful souls. Let me tell you a little bit about my story. Yada, yada, yada. Blah, blah, blah. I'm a boss babe. Mo money, mo money. With having a side business, I don't feel guilty taking those random shopping days. I get paid every Friday on the 15th. I get a bonus check. That's five times I'm getting paid a month on a job that I enjoy and have fun doing it. Do you need extra cash? Do you need a community of women behind you? Ask me how to join my team. I'm here to answer questions you may have. Ask yourself if what you're doing today is getting you closer to where you want to 
to be tomorrow. On Friday, I found out our team is currently ranked number 52 out of 450,000 other teams in our company. If you've been on the fence considering joining our team and starting your own online coaching business, I'd love to help you get started. Click the link in my bio, interested in coaching, and fill out the form. This could be the thing that completely changes your life for the better, like it has for me and so many other incredible people. It's social media posts that basically overly play into the girl boss persona. And the repercussion of this is that girl boss pretty soon after, although it was already on its way out, just lost all meaning. Now the term girl boss is basically meaningless and an internet meme and a joke. Now people make fun of women who call themselves girl bosses, even if the movement started out from a positive intention. At this point, it's been so overly commodified and it's been made into this materialistic and performative hashtag. There's a train in the background, sorry if you can hear it. <laughs> So soon after the wave of girl boss cringe, the hashtag girl boss trend began to die down. So what is the girl boss movement really? The girl boss movement is woke capitalism. There was nothing more meaningful and deeper about the movement. There was no true focus on change. It was all kind of just performative feminism about taking an individualistic approach to achieving some sort of monetary success. And I also have to point out the term girl boss? Girl boss was used for CEOs? Isn't that a little demeaning? Are we not like a little sketched out by that? <laughs> Same thing with boss babe. I don't think it's that much better. How many men call themselves boss bros? In fact, I would love to see that actually, the hashtag boss bro. <laughs> so the end of girl bosses is actually a pretty good thing. And let's hope in the future women can be bosses without having to put the label girl in front of it. And that's all I have to say on the evolution of the girl boss and the rise and fall of the boss babe trend. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe and give this video a like. And if you made it this far in the video, comment Gaslight Gatekeep Girl Boss to confuse a lot of people who haven't made it this far. And I will catch you in the next video. Bye.